going to start our reading at about verse 19. This is what it reads. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. A great place to, to start off and commence our, our thinking this evening on exactly this topic, probably our final night as we look at this particular discussion of what is the church. And as promised last week, we're going to zero in our focus tonight and think more specifically about what we might call the assembly or, or the Greek word that's used here in Hebrews chapter 10 is the synagogue. It means that the called out ones and the assembled ones in a place and time ready together to worship. We talked last week, and, and those who were here will remember we spent quite a bit of time dealing with the idea of the Christian church is a universal body. The Christian church is a body of believers that spans across all geographical locations, everywhere where there are people who trust in Jesus, and rightly so, based upon the revelation given in the gospel, are part of the Christian church. They're part of the body. They're part of the building, the house of God, the structure. They belong in the Christian church. And that church universally doesn't just span across geographical limitations, but spans across chronological limitations as well. So that we might say that everyone who has found favor in God's sight by the substitutionary turning death of the Messiah and his resurrection is part of the Christian church universally. No matter when they lived, no matter how or what location they lived, we all belong to one universal church. And we looked at the structure of that church as the Bible reveals to us in Ephesians how we're to think about it. We're to think about the, the cornerstone. You remember we labored this last week. The cornerstone of the Christian church is Christ. In so much as Paul labored to communicate that the head of the body is Jesus, Paul in another metaphor or another analogy wants to communicate that the cornerstone of the building is Jesus Christ. And we, we saw that if the cornerstone is perfect, plumb, is true on every angle and every line and every side, then the rest of the structure can be quite adequately built with imperfect blocks. That the cornerstone by its perfection perfects the engineering of the entire structure because that's the way God deems it should be in these times of the ancient Near Eastern uh, building. And so Paul uses this idea that the universal church is made up of people who are not perfect, who are fallen and frail and weak and at times at times, are sinful. And yet because of the substitutionary turning death of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, His perfection is imputed to us and our sin was imputed to Him on the cross so that in Him we might live eternally because we bear, we are clothed in the righteousness of God. We're going to, as I said, we're going to zero in, so to speak. We're going we're gonna to narrow our focus now, not so much about the church universally and the structure and the cornerstone and on the foundation of the scripture, the prophets and the apostles, but we're going to look more specifically about the local assembly, the, the local group. Is it, is it okay for the church just to be one universal body of people who are not connected in any meaningful way? They're kind of out there, independent, autonomous individuals doing their own thing, serving Jesus their own way, reading the Bible to their own interpretation, and above all, just being somewhat disconnected. Is that okay? Well, the New Testament would tell us that that's in fact not okay. The local assembly is the beating heart of the church universal. Jesus has called his followers to assemble together, to be together, to celebrate salvation, to hear from God's voice in the word, and to come around the, the ordinances or the sacraments of Jesus Christ. This local assembly we might call the church, but of course there's a semantic ambiguity there, isn't there? There really is, because we might call the church the, the universal body. We might say the church of Jesus Christ in the world today is suffering great tribulation. And by that, we don't mean any individual assembly. We mean the body as a whole. 
Or we might say the Christian church at this city or this town or this street or in this building, as we find the New Testament uses the word in both ways. So when we use the word church tonight, we're thinking of the local assembly. And this local assembly, this church is called to minister, first and foremost, to God. To minister to God in worship, in praise, in thanksgiving, in repentance and confession of sin, and above all, in trusting Him to redeem us from our sins by Jesus Christ. The local assembly is called to serve its own members, and that's a service in the Word and the, sac- and the sacraments and in church discipline. And lastly, but not least importantly, the local assembly is called to serve the outside world, the rest of the world who are yet to trust in Jesus. It's the local assembly which is supposed to be the missional sending hub of the world. And wherever we find any of these three things done outside the local assembly, we're not going to say that they should stop or they should cease, but we're going to say the reason why parachurch organizations, the reason why other kind of Christian ministries rise up and take responsibility for these things is because by and large the church at many times and in many places is deficient in their ability. The reason why there are missional sending organizations that aren't a church is because the local church has been somewhat deficient in sending, supporting missions work. That's how we should think of the local assembly. There to serve God, serve the world in mission, and serve its own members in the service of the word, sacraments, and discipline. We need to spend a few minutes tonight at looking at the, the birth and the adolescence of the Christian church and begin to learn Exactly what that means. You see, the local church, as a local church, was born at Pentecost. You remember Jesus met with his disciples, and he said to his disciples, his apostles rather, and those who had followed him, he told them to fear not, to tarry in Jerusalem, in an upper room, and await. Don't do anything. Wait the Spirit's power from on high. And Luke records accurately for us that event in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit came, empowered the apostles to to speak in tongues and the miraculous uh, example of that scenario. And then at that time in Jerusalem, there were people from all around the local vicinity in the known world who had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish Passover. Jewish people from all around the surrounding villages and towns and cities had traveled for many days and some of them many weeks to get to Jerusalem to celebrate in the temple of God the Passover, as was a Jewish custom. In other words, the city of Jerusalem had every bit ballooned in population to many tens and tens of thousands of people. And it's on that day the Spirit comes, empowers the apostles, Peter preaches that great Pentecost sermon and calls people to repentance and faith in Jesus. That's what happens when a church is born. It's born out of the work of preaching the gospel. We're told that day that thousands repent, are baptized, and give their life to Jesus. By this time we reach Acts chapter 6, quite a period of time has elapsed. The local church has grown significant, more than, perhaps more than 10,000 people. The local Jerusalem uh, citizens, they know who the Christians are. This is a massive subculture within the greater city limits of Jerusalem. A group of about 10,000 people would not have been a little blip on the radar, but would have been very much probably the greatest subculture in Jerusalem at the time. From the day of Pentecost on, people were baptized, they identified as Christians, or not using that term of course, that's reserved for later on, but they identified as followers of Jesus And they were added to the church many, many thousands. The first local church begins to keep record of this. And we are told that, uh, we know that in chapter 4, about 5,000 men were added to the role, added to the, the ministry of the church. The early church met unofficially in the temple daily. And they met officially at certain places at certain times for public worship, public prayer, and the preaching of the gospel. But the bulk of these people, if not all of these people, are Jewish people. They are Jewish people. What's happened is, as I mentioned to you, these Jews from all around the local vicinity arrived for the Passover festival around about the time of Acts chapter 2, and Peter preaches his great Pentecost sermon, and they are radically born again. They're radically regenerate. They trust in Jesus, and they don't want to go home. Why would they go home? This is where the church is. 
in Jerusalem. And so the majority of them actually sell their businesses, their homes, their possessions, where they live, many days journey, many weeks journey, bring the money to the apostles and give it to them so that they can live in some commune fashion. Not everybody. There were many people who were part of the church that lived in Jerusalem. They kept their homes. That's why the Bible tells us they begin to meet home to home. It's not like everyone sold their house. But those who come from out of town did not leave Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost. They were so enraptured with this new life they found in Christ, they stuck it out. What began to happen is there's two classes of people. This always happens whenever, whenever a group of humanity gets together, it begins to divide among kind of subcultures and, and different types of people. And this is what happened in the Jerusalem church. The Jews who were living in Jerusalem considered themselves to be of a little bit of a higher notch or higher class of people. And the other Jews that lived outside of Israel at the time, who sold their possessions and moved to Jerusalem to be part of the church, they were called the Hellenistic Jews. And they were treated with perhaps not as much respect and and definitely not as much empathy. When we look here at Acts chapter 6, I'm going to read a passage here. You're going to find something happening. You're going to start to see now as we begin to look at this story of the Christian church, a structure and an organization begin to actually take place. And this is where we need to have our ears pricked up, our hearts ready to learn, because these systems and structures that are put in place are to last, they are to stay. And we find this in Acts chapter 6. Luke records for us, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There were many poor people part of the church. Many poor people. And those who'd come from out of town, sold all they had for the mission, for the kingdom, gave to the apostles... They expected their widows to be treated as fairly and as openly as the widows of the Jews who had resided in Jerusalem. But that wasn't happening. And so we find a complaint arose, a valid complaint, that the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Verse 2, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, this is, this is like, this is like a, an AGM en masse. They, everyone, let's get together. Let's sort this out. And the disciples, the apostles said, it's not right that we should give up the preaching of the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, uh, Procreus, Nicanor, Timon, Phamius, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles and prayed and laid their hands on them. Verse 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many priests became obedient to the faith. What's really happening here is every bit what we might describe historically as genuine revival. If by the time we reach Acts chapter 4, we have at least 8,000 members of this church. By the time we reach chapter 6, we might be looking anywhere from 10 to 15,000. And once they get this little dispute settled, now all of a sudden the word increased all the more. Now it's multiplying. You take 12,000 and multiply it, and even the priests in the temple are becoming converts. The, the, the first Christian church is using the temple. They know that the Jews are meeting on the, the Jewish Sabbath, and so they come into the temple on other days. The first day of the week, they begin to meet and pray and share the word and the sacrament. They begin to take up offerings on the first day of the week. And priests are coming in to check out what's happening. The word is striking them deep in the heart. They're being convicted of sin, repenting and trusting in Jesus Christ. We all know this is about to take a drastic turn of events in Jerusalem. Part of the problem of the church in Jerusalem, while they were doing everything in a great way, They were raising up servants. They were electing people to the office of a deacon. The the Greek word dekoni means to serve. And they elected these men. And at this point in Acts chapter 6, we have the first incident of a lasting office established for the Christian church. The apostles understood that it was not right for them to give up their ministry in the word and to come down to the tables and make sure that the food's being distributed fairly among the Hebrew Jews and the Hellenistic Jews, particularly the widows. 
So they knew that in order to have organization and structure and to have a, 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 an assembly that's disciplined in how they function, they should appoint servants to an official role of servant authority. This is very much, in a sense, the, the first lasting office that's actually established by the apostles to be in the Christian church to appoint deacons to the role of an authority. And so we find this great scenario, we find this great situation that this church was, was, was growing, was burgeoning. The pattern of this first church was to have many midweek gatherings, but the main general assembly, they celebrated the sacraments, would be on the first day of the week. It was a unique scenario, unrepeatable, because we saw last week presiding over this church were the apostles. And we know that while the apostles are there in, in the flesh, while they're there Physically, that's a unique situation. Yes, the apostles are here today. Yes, the apostles are the foundation of the church today. But they are those things in the word. They're not physically here. We can't just go ahead and make a phone call to Peter or write a letter to Paul and ask a question. We have to go to their writings, the foundation of the church, and find out what the apostles' will for the church is. Acts chapter 6 gives us this interesting situation where we realize the first continuing office of the Christian church is established, the deacons. But there are two. There are actually two lasting offices of authority in the Christian church. Deacon, which chronologically came first, but would be in authority surpassed by what we know as elders. There's much about the example of this first church that we can't emulate. There's much about what's happening in this first church and what happens, we looked at Acts chapter 6, you go one chapter next and Stephen's delivering this profoundly powerful sermon. He's stoned, an onslaught of persecution explodes upon that church like a bomb going off. They are scattered to the ends of the earth and all of a sudden we find people against their will are now missionaries. Scattered to flee persecution, even the apostles. So that only a few are left remaining in Jerusalem, what is now a greatly reduced church. And many of the apostles, many of the, the godly men and women are sent back to their hometowns and their villages and the countries where they're from, and they are now seeking to plant and to emulate something of that, that community that they experienced in Jerusalem. There's plenty about that that we should think about emulating, but there's a lot we can't. We can't repeat the office of the apostle. But what we desire to know is what, if any, were the plans for the church after the departure of the apostles? What were the apostles thinking would become of the church after their departure? And when I say that, I'm hoping that your ears immediately and your mind immediately races to what we saw a few weeks ago, Acts chapter 20. You remember the scenario, Acts chapter 20 builds up this great deal of tension as Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to an untimely death, and he knows that. He knows when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be beaten, flogged, he's going to be whipped, he's going to be imprisoned, tortured, he's going to be put before trial, and whether he knows it or not, he's going to end up before Caesar in Rome, and he's going to end up with his head lopped off. And yet before Paul goes, he meets, you remember, with the Ephesian elders. At this point in the history of the Christian church, I wish we had time to map this month by month, year by year, but we really don't on, on one night together, and so we just race ahead. At this point, when Paul's on his journey to Jerusalem, he's already began establishing in the local assemblies an eldership, a plurality of elders. And when he calls these elders to him in Acts chapter 20, the Ephesian elders, particularly from that church, he says to them, you remember we exegeted that entire speech from Paul not three weeks ago, he told them, hold on, get a tight grip, tighten up your belts, tighten up your boot laces. God's going to send a whole new team of apostles. You remember? No, you don't remember because he doesn't say that. At no point does he say, just wait out. God, I'm going to send a whole bunch of apostles. They're going to be like Peter, James, Paul, John, Matthew, Lee, Bartholomew, a whole new team. And they're going to be able to help you out because really you're going to be in a bit of a, a, bit of a muddy situation. No. Nope. Not at all. Paul tells them, you're in real trouble. Fierce wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. But where he directs their attention is the word. The word. It's the word. The eldership is the second lasting office of the Christian church. 
The apostles knew that their day was dying out. As apostle after apostle was giving up their life and spilling their blood for the cause of Christ, they were aware that this, that this era of apostolic work is coming to a close. Where God would call unique men who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and had unique authority to write scripture by the Spirit's empowerment that that day was coming to an end. And the structure of the local assembly would be eldership. Paul's charge to Titus in Titus chapter 1. If you've got a, got a Bible, I invite you to turn to Titus chapter 1. Either way, I'm going to read it for our hearing anyway. Paul says in Titus chapter 1, this is a unique situation, and it gives us an idea of how an apostle sees the lasting ministry of the Christian church. Paul writes, I'm going to start reading from verse 1 here. Paul says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth which accords with righteousness. In hope of eternal life which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. If only time, right? If only we had time to exegete that. But we don't. Let's move on. Verse 4. To Titus. This is Paul's writing to Titus. Titus is not an apostle. To Titus, my true child in the common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. This is why, verse 5, Paul says to Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. I'd have you focus your attention on that word right now. Order. The church needs to be Ordered, not dysfunctional, not in disarray, not in disunity, not with everyone doing their own thing and their own autonomous mindset and doing their own ministry and no, no real unity or structure. Paul says, I want the churches in Crete, and of course everywhere else that Paul ministered, I want them to be ordered. And appoint elders in every town as I directed you. That's how it's happening. Now we saw when we looked at this in, in Acts chapter 20, we saw that Paul actually tells the Ephesian elders, fierce wolves are coming in, they're going to not spare the flock, they're going to rip and tear and destroy and consume young and, 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 and vulnerable believers, not sparing anybody, and it's up to you, the elders, by the ministry of the word, to protect, to guard, and to establish people in the faith. That's your job. And Paul's command for every local church is that they would mature to the point where they have elders. Elders. Not one, but a plurality of serving men, duly called by God, duly appointed by the assembly, and fulfilling a set criteria, which if we were reading on in Titus, we'd come across. But don't worry, we're going to find that here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 with me. Qualifications for overseers. Now, don't be concerned. It's not a different group of people. The word overseer here comes from the same lexical root as we understand elder or those who oversee the church of God. Verse 1 of 1 Timothy 3. Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying. If anyone aspires the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. The ministry of the word is high priority. Let's read on. Verse 3, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all diligence, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church? Of God. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with the conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. This office of the elder, which is meant to be experienced in local assemblies as a plurality, is the highest priority and the highest authority in the flesh in the local church. That's whom Paul appoints. That's who the apostles appoint. In the Christian church, the appointment is for elders. Not apostle to apostle, 
There's nowhere in the New Testament we find any of the apostles laying hands on someone saying, now you're an apostle, you're going to be risen up and you're going to be in my authority and in my shoes and wear my mantle. There's nowhere in the New Testament that's found. But in every place and in every scenario, we find that the apostles were seeking the church would be ordered, structured, unified around the ministry of the eldership. It's about the quickest I can, I can give you this evening. Unfortunately, I... Trying to race to Hebrews chapter 10. We think about the structure of the local church. These two offices which are lasting, the office of an eldership, the authority, the teaching ministry, the discipline, and the exercise or the, 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 the offering and commissioning of the sacraments is through the ministry of the elders. And the deacons, the office of a deacon is to serve, to serve the needs of the assembly, to be there to help people out and give comfort and mercy and compassion. And every local church as it matures into being a a unified, vibrant body is to have these two callings functioning. As they stand upon the foundation, which is the prophets and the apostles, and at the corner, as we saw last week, is the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 for me. Therefore, verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence, reading verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Let me clarify what's going on here. At this point in Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews is writing to the people who are having grievous and great struggles in being Christians. The persecution from the outside world is very heated, very violent, very intense. And what's happening in in this day and age, you see, there there was really... There was a really easy way that you could find out who was really a Christian. If you went to prison in those days, you weren't offered a nice hot meal three times a day, comfortable bed, a toilet break, Foxtel TV, internet, and a university degree. That's all great for today. You weren't offered any of that in those days. You were chained to a wall, and if you wanted to eat or drink anything, your loved ones, family, or friends had to bring it to you. The state and the government's not feeding you. You're a criminal. And so the government finds some Christians and locks them up. Locks them up in prison. Now you find there's a challenge, isn't there? There's a real challenge now for these Christians. What are we going to do about this? Because as soon as we go and start giving these Christians food and water and supplying their medical needs and praying with them and encouraging them, we're going to get locked up. They're hunting us. They're after us. We're trying to stay hidden underground. And the author of Hebrews encourages the people and says this, Hey, listen. Listen, you were willing, he commends them in this, you were willing, willing to see, the, to see all your goods removed, that's what the government do, come and steal all your goods, to be locked up, lose your freedom, you're willing to endure all that to serve the brethren who are under trial. And the author of Hebrews gives them a great encouragement and a compliment in this, good for you. But what started to happen was that people began to neglect attending the public assembly. And you can kind of understand why, right? If you're being hunted like animals, they're trying to, they're trying to weed you out and unearth you wherever the Christians may be hiding. Then being in a local assembly like this is a pretty easy way to give yourself away, right? Yeah. But the author of Hebrews has a commendation for these people. He says to these people, if you have boldness to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, now, it doesn't occur to you immediately what the author is saying, but let me clarify it for you. There is no scarier place in the world than the holy of holies, the presence of God. There is no more frightening place in the world than standing before almighty, omniscient, omnipotent God. And you have enough boldness to walk into that holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the rending of the curtain, which is his flesh, by his death and the spilling of his blood. You have enough boldness to walk into that holy place. Then you can at least be bold enough to walk into the local church. That's nothing. That's nothing. Not even a hundred Caesars or emperors of Rome could hold the intimidation power of Almighty God. And yet our faith and our confidence says that we can walk boldly in the presence of God. And the application for the author here is this. Therefore, be bold to walk anywhere. If you're willing to go there, you should be willing to go anywhere. And if you're not, 
It might be because you haven't reckoned with the reality of what it means to stand before an almighty, omniscient, and omnipotent God. And so he says this, clearly says this, by the blood of Jesus, you walk by a new and living way that Jesus opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, you see the transition now, in God's presence, right, as a Christian, you have to walk into that, not, not physically, but figuratively. We come before God clothed in the righteousness of Christ and we plead, not based upon our works, but based upon the work of Christ. We plead for salvation and forgiveness. And over the household of God is the great high priest. The author says, let us draw near then. What's holding you back? Draw near. What's it going to cost you? What's the peril? What's the risk? What's the penalty? You're willing to walk before the very face of God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Then have boldness, friends, he says. Have boldness. Assemble together and assemble publicly and be bold in doing it. And let God take care of your enemies. This is the house of God. So let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, the author says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Because people are being discouraged. People are being beaten down. People are having their families rent apart, their homes burnt down, their possessions stolen. People are being thrown into prison and people are being thrown to lions. Therefore, think about this, Christian. How can you, in the local assembly, stir each other up to love and good works? The Christian walk in every scenario, in every place, in every time should always and must always be marked with the boldness of Jesus Christ, whom it was said, walked and set his face like flint toward Jerusalem, knowing that in Jerusalem he would be crucified and absorb the wrath of God, and yet boldness was in every step that Christ took. That's the mandate upon the Christian. Verse 25 is the key here. Look at verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. You think you've got a reason not to go to church. Right? You think you've got a, you've got a silver platter excuse to be absent from the assembly. You've got a good reason. Well, it's been a pretty hard week and a lot of work to do and not feeling the best. And That's all well and good. But before you do that, before you fail to meet in the assembly of the church, just realize, just realize what these people paid with their blood to be there in the public assembly. Just be aware of that. It's so easy for us. We put on two services on Sunday, pick and choose, come to both, have a weekend off, have two weekends off, come once a month, come once every six months, come when you feel, leave when you have to, do your best. That's all well and good. That's our mindset. That's the world we live in. That's what sometimes political freedom does to the heart of the Christian. It renders them lacking in boldness. But so does pressure, political, societal, persecution pressure. I'm not having to go at anyone. You're here, so this is the choir, right? So I can be as bold as I like in announcing this. No one's going to get offended. If you do, your offense is with the word, not with me. I'm telling you what the word says. At the risk of spilling your blood, at the risk of losing your home, your possessions, your job, your freedom, and even your life, the author of Hebrews says, stir one another up to love and good works and don't neglect the assembly. Because some are in the habit of doing that. Some are in the habit of neglecting the assembly. And the author understands why. It makes sense to neglect the assembly if your freedom or your livelihood or your career or even your life is at stake. And yet even that, even that the word of God to those people, the word of God to those people from Hebrews chapter 10, the word of God is boldness. If you're bold enough to walk into the holy of holies with the blood of Jesus, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, then be bold enough to stand with your face like flint before the world and say, I'm one of them. I'm a Christian. I'm of Jesus. And I'm going to meet in the house of God with the saints. That's what Hebrews 10 would say. Do not neglect the assembly of yourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. We need the assembly. 
Jesus himself promised this, that where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. It's not a promise whenever you get together with another Christian, whenever you get together with another Christian, there's Jesus. That's not the promise. The promise is that whenever there is an assembly of believers and the meeting is convened in the name of Jesus, the assembly like what we've just seen in Hebrews chapter 10, whenever you see that, God in Christ, by the Spirit, appears in power and glory in a very mystical and spiritual way to bless our lives. To be absent from the assembly is to render yourself discouraged and lacking in that unique corporate blessing. You can't get this anywhere else. You can't get, Jesus doesn't promise to do any other situation, driving your car to work, you're on an hour commute, you put on a great sermon, you get challenged, you get supercharged, you get to work, you're pumped up to live for Jesus. That's fine, but there is no, no compromise. There is no substitute for the assembly where God presents himself in grace and power. And that is good news. Because our circumstance isn't like theirs in Hebrews chapter 10. We aren't going to suffer great peril if we meet together. We aren't going to struggle and have our lives and our homes taken from us, our jobs taken from us. No one wants to employ a Christian in those days because Christians can't work on the first day of the week when they assemble together. To declare yourself as a Christian, to be so bold in the first century, to these people who the book of Hebrews is written to, to be so bold, to declare yourself a Christian, is to almost render your life over. But if you are bold enough to enter the Holy of Holies... And we are, by the blood of Christ, by the new and living way which has been purchased in his flesh, in his blood, in his death. And as he reigns and rises and resurrects in glory, we attend with him into that holy place. And if we're bold enough to do that, then whatever it costs, whatever the expense, whatever it might mean to be in the assembly, the scripture commands, we do it. With regularity, with deep commitment, and with constancy. It's here. It's here. It's in this local church. Not the universal church. That's great. And we spend time studying that. But it's in the local church where God commands the unique blessing. The presence of his spirit. I don't mean to tell you. I don't need to tell you rather how many people. The number would be countless. Who have found themselves, found themselves backslidden and in the end apostatized. Because they neglected the local assembly. This is the place and the preached word is the crux and the center of all that we do. We've come to hear from God and be challenged and provoked, as the author in Hebrews 10 says, to love and good works. Therefore, therefore, cast not away your confidence, but be all the more bold and all the more consistent as the day draws near. Now, I tell you right now, in that first century, in that first century, if the author can say the day is drawing near, what would that mean for us who live almost 2,000 years from then? It means the day is infinitely closer. The day is drastically nearer us than it was them. And so all the more the imperative is binding upon us. Let us stand firm and be constant in the assembly. Would you pray with me as we close and ask God's blessing upon the exposition of his word? We do thank you, Father, as we close out our, our discussions of the Christian church this evening. We thank you for these four weeks of, of great study and not a great deal of depth, Father, as you understand the restraints of this medium, but Lord, the great wisdom which we've been blessed with by your word. We've thought about your Christian church, Father, that which you've blessed the earth with the Christian church, that which Christ purchased in his blood. We've seen it as a body, we've seen it as a flock, we've seen it as a structure. And now we've seen it as an assembly, as the called out ones, the, the synagogue, eh? those who have been drawn together with a common heart under the name of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the proclamation of the gospel that any and all who trust in Jesus will be saved forever. I thank you, Lord, for the reassurance that our hearts feel this evening as we, we meditate upon this reality that we do draw near. We do draw near to the holy place. We come before you, Father, in a new and living way. We come clothed in the righteousness of Christ and we ought to be bold in our coming. And if we can face you, Father, and we must, then I pray the Spirit empowers us to face the world around us. I pray the Spirit empowers us to face our family, our friends, our neighbors, our bosses, 
our employees, our work colleagues, our teachers, our lecturers, our friends, whoever and wherever and however, even strangers, I pray we would receive an emboldening of the Spirit to stand for Christ and to preach that gospel. I thank you for it, Father, but above all this evening, let us, let us meditate on the awesome privilege it is to have a local assembly where we can come, where we can call home, where we can grow together as one body knit together and united by the Spirit under Christ, each bringing our unique gifts and our unique skills and our unique experiences and, and each contributing to the mission and the work, Father, of your Son Jesus in the world today. I thank you that the centerpiece of this assembly, Father, is your word where you speak to us in the scripture. And may we never depart or detract from that. I thank you, Father, above all for your grace that we've assembled tonight. We've heard about what this assembly really is. That you've instituted in this assembly two continuing officers, the elders and the deacons, to serve and to pursue the mission of Christ. And above all, Father, I, I pray that you be glorified as you bring that conviction of the Spirit into each of our hearts, we think to ourselves, what manner of excuses in the past we've allowed, to, we've allowed to ease our consciences, we've abstained from the assembly, we've made it a habit from being apart from the assembly. And may we be challenged this evening, Father, as we think about that first century of Christians who gave it all just to be part of the public assembly. We think of all the generations of Christians, even since then, and even in the world today, Father, where if people assemble in Christ's name, they risk their lives. And yet they do. They do not cast away their confidence. They are filled with boldness, and they stand for Christ. I pray that we'd be so encouraged by that. That we'd realize that, of course, there might, Father, be valid reasons why we can't be in the assembly but let us be deeply convicted for those times when we've allowed less than valid reasons keep us from the worship of the church. We thank you, Father, for your spirit. We thank you for your son. We thank you for salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.